Amen. Have a seat, and while you're being seated, uh, you can take your Bibles and open them to 2 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to dig in this morning in verses uh, 1 through 10 of chapter 2. And, and this morning, I want to throw out as a title a word of caution. Caution, there are false prophets out there. There are false preachers out there. There are, are, are false uh, counselors out there. Not everybody that's out there that's doing things in the name of God is actually honoring the Lord as, as the Lord would have them do. And so this morning, as we, as we dig in, I want you to be reminded, you know, that we have been encouraged in 2 Peter thus far that our lives would be lived in a godly kind of a way. And Peter writes in chapter 1, verse 10, he says, Brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. And he's talking about trusting in the great and the precious promises of God. Trusting in the great and the, the precious promises of God. And so the goal of what Peter is seeking to accomplish is that we would be firmly rooted. Now that word firm in the Greek is the word sterizo. It means to be fixed firmly. It means to be strengthened. It means to be made stronger. And so Peter's goal in writing is the Spirit of God fills him up is that uh, he wants us to be so firmly established in the Lord that we cannot be shaken. To be so firmly established in the Lord that we cannot be shaken. That we'll be able to stand. He writes in chapter 3, verse 17, he said, Therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the eras of lawless people, and lose your own stability. And so he's, he, he's summing up what he's writing in chapter 2. He's telling us to be firm. He's telling us to be unshakable. He's telling us to be stable in the faith. And so Peter has reminded us about the great and precious promises of the Lord. And he assures us that if we trust firmly in these things that God has promised, that God's power will flow in our lives. In chapter 1, verse 4, he says that we've escaped from the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. We've escaped. In other words, you know, when we came to Christ, God did something in our lives. He did something in our spirit and our soul. He did something in our body. We have escaped that which once held us in captivity. We have gotten away from that which once tore us down. We have been made new in Christ Jesus. And, and so we are to continuously grow in godliness, to become, in, become godly in our character, in our thought processes, in the way that we live. And then in verse 21 of chapter 1, he says, There's been no prophecy that was ever produced by the will of man. See, all these things that he's talking about, they're not an accident, but these things come from God. He said, But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so the confirmation of God's work in our life leads us to a confidence in his promises. You know, when you first trust Jesus to be your Savior, you're making that decision, and you're not 100% confident. But then, you know, you feel this relief, you sense this relief that your sins have been forgiven, and you've entered into a relationship with Christ, and your confidence builds. And as you grow in the Lord, your confidence grows more and more, and you become bolder and bolder in your faith in Jesus Christ. And so the confirmation of God's Word leads to that. And, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a confirmation that's personal. You know, I know it to be true in my life, and you know it to be true in your life. It's experiential. We experience these kinds of things as we, uh, as we come before the Lord. So as he writes chapter 2, uh, he, he's writing for the same goal in mind, but that goal, and that goal is to devote ourselves to God, to rely on His power, to live godly with love. And, but the, the, the approach is going to now change. And the change, the change is from, you know, the goal of, uh, of recognizing and trusting in these great and precious promises to a warning. You know, a warning of destruction when we fail to look to God 
who makes the promises to us. You see, in relying, in failing to rely on God, there's a there's a, there's given a description of what happens to those who fall prey to the false teachers in the church. Now, as I approach Second Peter, I, I find that all of Peter is very difficult to work through because Peter, you know, he's like that kid that quit that quit taking classes in school to go fishing, and he doesn't have everything down together, and he's very hard to work with. I was telling a couple of preacher friends of mine earlier this week, I've been working on this passage for a couple of weeks, said, I'm preaching through 2 Peter, and they're saying, why would you do that? Because it's such a difficult area, particularly on Sunday morning. But I think it's important that we on Sunday morning gather this. Have you ever heard of a fifth column? Anybody ever heard of a fifth column? Those of you who uh, have been in the military have heard of the fifth column. And here it is, a fifth column uh, was a clandestine group or faction of subversive agents who attempt to undermine a nation's solidarity by any means at their disposal. And this term was credited to Emilio Mola Vidal, who was a nationalist general during the Spanish Civil War that began in 1936. You know, he had four of his army columns moving on Madrid, and the general referred to the militant, militant supporters within the capital as his fifth column, intent on undermining the loyalist government from within. Peter tells us that although the church is protected from the outside, God protects his church. Oftentimes within the church, there is that fifth column. In our text this morning, in verses 1 through 4, the Scripture says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many, and many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed and in their greed they will exploit you with false words but their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep for if God did not spare the angels when they sinned but cast them into hell and committed them to the chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the midnight think about what lies in store for those false teachers and so within the church of Jesus Christ, there are those faults, uh, those fifth columns who attempt to align themselves in the church. Sometimes it's a pastor, a teacher, a leader, a counselor. And, and so, you know, we have, to, we have to be cautious ourselves when it comes to that pastor, that teacher, that leader, that counselor, that these people who are teaching us, who are preaching God's word, are doing so not without, without, with the intent of undermining. They're not doing so as, as a false teacher, as a false prophet. So we have to take every word that's taught us, every word that's preached to us, every word that's counseled to us, back to the Word of God and see how it stands up. Now, the problem within many churches uh, across the Western world is is the congregations, they come on Sunday morning and they're sort of spoon-fed. And, and everybody thinks, I got my dose of God, I got my dose of religion this week, and they go on and they never dig in and they never grow deeper and they never grow stronger. But we all have a responsibility to look at these kinds of things. I mean, I could be wrong. I can't remember a day when I was wrong, but I could be. And so we have to regard these columns because, you see, what's at stake is this battle that's going on. It's a battle between the eternal kingdom of joy, of joy and the kingdom of eternal misery. The eternal kingdom of joy and eternal misery. You see, proclamation of the gospel that is not focused on Jesus Christ is heartless. It's heartless because if we just stand and, and talk about how good you are and we talk about all the possibilities you have 
and, and we think about all the things that tickle our ears and make us feel good up and down and gives us that, that run on the spine that goes, ooh, you know. And, you know, people want to walk out and say, man, we had church today. I feel so good. My spine's still tingling. All this kind of stuff. It's heartless because it treats life as though it were a game. When, in fact, eternal joy in the kingdom of Jesus Christ and eternal misery and hell are at stake. And the largest concern... And that, and, and, and that sets the church off as distinct from all other human institutions is this responsibility that we have to always, to always be true to the Scriptures. And so, as I read through this text of 2 Peter chapter 2, I recognize it's aimed at me and it's aimed at you. It challenges us that we always keep our hearts in Jesus Christ and that we share His redeeming love with others around us. And so when I stand and preach, it's not simply to be a, a pep talk that challenges you to think positively. I'm challenged to be faithful in my calling and to have an anger towards false teaching. And when I think of, of, of what happens every day and what I think about what happens every hour between the, the kingdom of eternal joy and, and the kingdom of eternal misery, some 6,316 people die every hour in this world. Last week I read about a couple of rappers who were shot and killed and it angers me. This morning, I heard on the news that a sheriff's deputy here in Florida went to pull over for a normal traffic stop, an individual, and when they got her pulled over, she took a gun and shot and killed herself. You know, we live in a sick world. We live in a broken world. We live in a world that's torn apart, and there's this battle going on between an eternal kingdom of joy in the presence of God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit and an eternal kingdom of misery and darkness and hell. But fortunately, our God tells us in His Word that there's an answer for the world's sin problem. And so this chapter is no accident. It is the Word of God. It is Holy Scripture. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy concerning the validity of Holy Scripture, and he said this. He said, all Scripture, it doesn't matter if it's in Jude or if it's in one of the minor prophets, all Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, is breathed out by God, and it's profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So Peter comes in, and this is what he flashes. It's a news flash. Caution! You know, if you've got the Weather Channel app on your phone, you get these cautions. You know, rain will begin at 643. I don't know why they keep sending me stuff for Broward County. Don't they know that's way down south? And we're almost in Alabama. But, you know, they send you these things out, or, or uh, the weather bugs got this little thing on there. It's a spark indicator, and you hit that, and it shows you how close the lightning is. You know, caution. Well, well, Peter says, caution, there are false prophets who deny the master. Did you notice that in verse number one of our text? He said, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And, and what we find is, is that whenever truth is at stake, counterfeits will always come in. You know, a, a $20 bill is a pretty significant piece of money to have, right? Amen? But, you know, why is it that when you go to the store and you give them a $20 bill, they make a mark on it to see if it's real? Because there's going to be a counterfeit. There's going to be a counterfeit. And when the truth of God is presented, there's always going to be a, a counterfeit. In the Old Testament, men claimed to speak from God when he had not sent them. In Deuteronomy 18.8, 8, 
uh, 1820. It says, The prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I've not commanded him to speak, who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet's going to die. In the New Testament church, there were those... Uh, there arose uh, those whose explanations and applications of doctrine were false and were destructive. And Peter says these false teachers will arise in the future, and it's clear that they had already arisen when he writes this letter. And the very first thing you note about them, they're denying the Master. They're denying the Master. Now, there are groups out there in the name of Christianity, in the name of Christianity that deny the Master. There's one group, they even call themselves a church. They call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, that sounds like a godly name. Why, we're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, dig into it. They believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son. Man, that sounds good, doesn't it? Hello, does that sound good? I mean, that's what you believe, right? Dig in a little bit more. Do I ever say that Jesus Christ is a Son of God? What do I say? The. And that's the difference. That's the difference. And the Jehovah's Witnesses, man, they hit the beach parking lots out here in the mornings. They're going to catch everybody that's out to look at the sunrise or out for a morning run, and they're going to want to hand you the watchtower and invite you to their thing. I had a young lady in my office a while back, and I was talking to her, you know, about her faith in Christ. She said, you know, I'm in three Bible studies. I go to one, you know, it's in this kind of church, and I go to another one, this kind of church, and then I have a Bible study in my home every Monday night. I said, oh, what's that? She says, well, there's two people who come and two ladies who come, and they're teaching me about what the Word of God really says. And I said, Are they Jehovah's Witnesses? And she said, yes. Now, what are the marks of these kinds of groups? The marks of these kinds of groups are are these. Unorthodox teaching. They secretly bring in destructive heresies. Unorthodox teaching can sometimes be very difficult to recognize. I mean, they don't have on a, a large name tag that says, My name is Joe, and I'm a false prophet. No pointing towards you there, Joe, just because you taught class a while ago. They don't wear a name tag that says, My name is Mary, I'm a false teacher. That's not what they do. They're, they're sneaky and they come in and, and they secretly introduce their new ideas and, and they begin to, to groom and, and bring people in and they make up stories even about their ministry so as to impress people. They have, get this, new truths. You know, that's how the Mormons got started. They got a new truth. Their founder, Joseph Smith, he went and found some tablets that God supposedly wrote to the North American Indians. Wait a minute, does that make sense? You see, God has given you everything you need for life today and for life to come in the, in the confines of His Word between Genesis and Revelation. And, and you don't need a watchtower publication to help you know how to really know God and be one of his Jehovah Witnesses. You don't need that. God's given you everything. Now, we provide magazines, mature living, parenting, raising teens, all kinds of stuff. But they're not prescribing you things outside of the Bible. They're teaching you biblical truth. And another sign of these false teachers is they had a free morality. A free morality is another avenue in which they diminish Christ. And these things, these false teachers uh, uh, dealt in that area of morality. And, and, and you know, here's what we find. Uh, false doctrine and false morality oftentimes go hand in hand. Now, remember what Paul told the Corinthians? He said, you were bought Wait a minute, bought? Yes, you were bought. Jesus Christ paid a price for you. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Peter puts it this way, knowing that you were ransomed from your futile ways. So ransomed and bought, same idea, that that we were brought back 
by what Christ did. And so when the apostles spoke of being bought or being ransomed by Christ, this is what they pictured us as. They pictured us as slaves of sin and slaves of Satan who are being purchased and made free from, from the sin that, that we might serve Christ and glorify God. I'm free, free forever, I'm free. Isn't that what we just sang? You know, we were slaves to sin. We were slaves to these old things that pulled us, these desires, these, these uh, passions. We were, we're letting our body pull us away from God and our mind pull us away from God. But we've been set free from that. And we have uh, been brought, brought by Christ to be freed from the domination of those passions. And, and specifically, Peter talks about sexual passions. You see, we belong to a new master whose promises are superior to those promises of sex. That we can escape from the lordship of that kind of passion. And when this happens, we exalt Christ, we affirm His worth. But if we live in the grip of sexual domination, we belittle Christ, and we deny the Master who bought us. Now look in chapter 2, verse 2. It says, Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. Sexuality is simply a word for blatant sexual immorality. Paul wrote concerning that in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 5, he said, It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that's not even tolerated among pagans. For a man has his wife's father, and you are arrogant. And Peter writes in chapter 2, verse 18, For speaking loud boast of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. And so these false teachers have an arrogance and an immorality that go hand in hand. And chapter 2, verse 10 says that they not only indulge in a defiling passion, but they despise authority. They despise authority. Now let me bring what Peter's saying into this day and into this age. Now understand... I am not degrading anyone. I'm not saying that anyone is unwelcome in this church. But what I am saying is this. When a false teacher tells you things like, and this is the way they would speak today. Well, of course young people should live together before they get married. Have you heard that argument? They should live together before they get married because, you know, you never buy a car without trying it out. What? But this is, this is the, the rationale. Why, of course it's okay to live in a homosexual, promiscuous lifestyle. And there's whole churches that are dedicated to that. But this is false prophecy. This is false preaching. It is false teaching. It is false counsel. Not according to me. I mean, you can write me a hate note. That's okay. But this is what God's Word says. Now, on the other side, as, as, as good Christians as we ought to be, this is, we have to be open. We've got to be welcoming. We've got to be loving. We've got to be sharing. We've got to be speaking truth. Real love is going to speak truth. Real love is going to speak truth. Now, sometimes it's hard to speak truth in real love. But real love will speak truth. And so, you know, we we, uh, we see that. And and then another mark is great popularity. But these false prophets, verse 1, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, they speak a message that flatters. They tell people how good they are. This is how you can live your best life now. They tell people and they speak to the wishes of the people rather than speaking about hard discipleship. You know, hard discipleship, I mean, think about that. When you, the day you get saved, you may think, man, I love this Christian life. I feel the burden's been lifted off. Woo! You know, right? 
But discipleship, growing in Christ, is hard. I mean, how many of us can say that throughout this week, I have spent time in diligent prayer every day? How many of us can say that throughout this week, I have spent time reading and studying God's Word every day? Throughout this week, I can, I can declare that every opportunity that I've had, I have shared the love of Christ. I can declare that every time an evil thought came towards my head, I turned the other way. Who can declare that I have not had a, a bad uh, inkling towards anybody whatsoever? Who can declare that I've lived perfectly? I mean, I don't live perfectly. You don't live perfectly. We cannot declare that. And so, you know, the Word of God teaches us that discipleship's difficult, but it's right. And the Scripture says, in their greed, they'll exploit you. They'll exploit you with false words. They bring on a damaged evangelism. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. The effect of this kind of teaching destroys the witness of the believing church. You know, they teach things like, you know, you can be good. That's not true. You can't be good. You know, you can't get to heaven by being good. You know, back uh, when praise songs first started coming around, in a little church I attended in Southern California, we'd do these praise songs on Sunday night, one of the favorite ones that everybody liked to sing. Oh, you can't get to heaven in dirty blue jeans because God ain't got no washing machine, you know. But they did these things, you know, and uh, I can't remember all those other verses that went along with it, but you can't get to heaven by being good. I mean, listen to what Paul writes to the Romans. Now, this, this is not about hopelessness. But this is what he says. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, every one of us have sinned. Sin means we miss the mark. We don't live up to God's standards. We we trespass. You know, God draws a line and we step across it. You know, it's like the kid that that the mama said, you're going to sit in that chair. And he sits down. And she turns and he's standing up. She says, if you don't sit down, you're going to sit there all day till you learn to get a bit different attitude. So she turns, and, and he, he's still sitting. And she says, are you learning anything from sitting? And he says, yeah, I'm still standing in my heart. <laughs> you know, that's what it means to trespass. And, and so, you know, we've all sinned. I mean, you won't believe this, but Wade sinned this week. I sinned this week. You sinned this week. We've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And it goes on and it says this. He says, there's none righteous. No, not one. No one of us is righteous. I look across this great congregation and I don't see a righteous individual. No, not a single one. No one who understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. And then he tells us in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of that kind of a life, the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God and all that's good. That leaves us hopeless. But the God who created us, he loves us enough not to leave us hopeless, not to leave us rotting away and held in those lower passions that drag us down and destroy our lives. He loves us, but God... But God, the Scripture says, gave us a free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. In other words, if you believe that Christ was raised from the dead, He was more than a man historically. If you believe that He was raised from the dead, He had to be something special, and He came and He lived, and you believe that He died in your place, and He was buried in your place, and He rose for your steed, and He will be your Savior. You see, that's not false prophecy. That's what the Bible tells us. 
But some would lead us in other ways. They, they, these, these false prophets have suspect motives. And in their greed, they'll exploit you with these false, with these false words. You know, they're motivated by their greed. Yes, Lord, I hear that. I'll tell the congregation. Congregation, I believe that you're supposed to give me a gift of a half million dollars. I need a nice motor home. An all-terrain one that you can pick up in Missouri. Four-wheel drive. Sustain you out there for two months without ever having to see you again for two months. No, that's what they do, though. I believe God's told uh, all of you supporters to give enough money. We need, the ministry needs a, a new jet airplane to, to get around the world. You've heard that. Remember those guys in the 90s that were on TV? And there's somebody out there listening whose back hurts. That's me. That was me last week, right? If you'll send in your seed money, ten to, no, don't, don't stop with 10 just go ahead and send a hundred. And your prayer request, we're going to pray over your prayer request on this table, and we're going to send you a special cloth. A special cloth. Oh, or we're going to send you some water from the Jordan River. Don't look for it to be clear because the Jordan River doesn't flow clear, okay? And these guys, you know, had the investigative reporters on them. Some people, you know, they, they got in there and pulled the money out of the envelopes. The envelopes going in the trash, going in the dumpster. You see, they're motivated by their greed. They're going to exploit. You know, if you're going to be obedient to the Lord and be obedient in giving, you got to do this. you got to give through His church where there's checks and balances. There's checks and balances. You know, our church, we have accountants that come in and work through the books every Monday morning. We've got uh, teams of counters who count the money. We've got somebody else who writes the checks, and then there's an annual audit, and all these different kinds of things go on. You know, you need checks and balances. But that's the kind of world we live in. That's what these false prophets are looking like. But understand something. You think, well, isn't God going to do something? Absolutely. If you notice in the text, God is ever watching. But God is ever watching. In verse 3 it says, Their greed, they'll exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle. Their destruction's not asleep. And so he goes into this whole section on God's past judgment. In verses 4 through 10, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he didn't spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction, extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them, day after day he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. And the point of this is to give us a warning. He first talks about those fallen angels. Uh, he didn't spare those angels. Verse, in, in verse 4 it tells us. And what a lesson there is here. Angels are glorious and mighty beings under God, but all their power and all of their dignity was of no use when they sinned against glorious God. And God's unsparing in His sentence. They're cast out of His presence and have been reserved in darkness until the great judgment day when they will be assigned to the lake of fire and brimstone to be tormented both day and night forever and ever, according to Revelation 20.10. And false teachers should learn from them that this is what they would get when they despise authority and reject the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 25, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then he talks about Noah. 
if you didn't uh, spare the ancient world but preserve Noah. You know, if the false teachers don't learn the lessons from the fallen angels, maybe they can learn it from the flood, and God swept away people uh, of the ungodly in judgment. And even though the rebellious and the licentious today may think they're safe, somebody pointed out, you know, that's why they've got the symbol of the rainbow. They're saying God's not going to ever judge this again. Judgment will come. Judgment will come. And, and the Bible tells us from of old their condemnation has not been idle and their destruction is not sleeping. And third, he gives us the illustration of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and they were turned to extinction. And so if the case of fallen angels and the case of Noah's generation do not deter people from following the false teachers, surely the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah will wake them up to God's wrath. For these cities were judged for the very licentiousness that the false teachers command. But the promise of God is this. God has been our help in ages past. Paul says, Peter says in verse 9, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. God knows how to rescue us. And of course, Peter doesn't just mean God knows how to do it. It means that God has done it in the past, God will do it today, and God will do it in the future. You see, when we come to Christ and confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that we would be saved, that means that we were saved from all of our past sins. It means that we're being saved right now in the present tense. And it means that we're saved for the future. God will do it. And, and the old song says, Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame, from everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. God never changes. He's the same yesterday as he is today and will be tomorrow. He doesn't change. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. Time like an ever-rolling stream bears all its suns away. They fly forgotten as a dream, dies as the opening day. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, be thou our guard while life shall last and our eternal home. God is our hope. I want to give you a couple of takeaways this morning. Number one, the church is not immune to false teachers. Not immune. So we have to keep ourselves rooted and grounded, sterizio, firmly planted in the Lord. Peter writes in chapter 3, verse 17, Therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Number two, those who advocate sexual immorality are heretics, and the teaching is heresy. Number three, divine judgment's coming upon those who deny Jesus Christ in any way. And number four, you can be spared the judgment if you turn and trust Jesus as righteous Lot. When God calls righteous Lot righteous, it's not because Lot never failed. It's not because Lot never sinned. It's not because... Lot was never enticed. It wasn't because Lot was, was, was perfect, but Lot recognized his imperfection and trusted in the righteousness of God. See, God has been our help in ages past, and he's given us all these things that have brought us to this moment. Our biblical history is for our instruction. Our familial history is for where we are today. You're here today because you had parents. Hello? 
And some of you have had some godly parents, and some of you have had some ungodly parents. But I would venture to say that somewhere in your family tree, there have been some family members who've been godly. How many of you know of a family godly member in your family tree? You see, it goes up all over the room. And God has brought you to this place that you might be, instead of the false prophet Joe or the false teacher Mary, that you might be righteous Joe and righteous Mary. That we can stand righteous in His sight because Christ has come and lived and died and we have entrusted Him to be both our Lord and our Savior. I'm going to pray. Our music team is making their way to the stage right now. We're going to sing a song of decision. There's some of you who need to trust Christ to be your Savior. I want to invite you to come up and say, Pastor, I want to trust Christ. Even if you don't come up, just right where you are, just say, oh God, would you enter into my life? Would you take a hold of me? And maybe we can talk a little later. Some of you, God's leading to be a part of this church family, some through baptism. And some of you are saying, God, I've been swayed, and I don't want to be swayed. I want to be firm in Christ. Help me to study your word and to pray and to talk to you and to be all that you've called me to be. Would you pray with me, Father? We give you these moments, and we pray that you'd be honored and glorified in our midst as we turn our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing. You come right now.